This is NJTV. NJTV's fiscal year ends June 30th. Please go online or call us. Donate now and show your support for our high quality and independent programming. From the production studios of Montclair State University, this is NJTV News with Mike Schneider. Midnight deadline, the governor and lawmakers running out of time to make their legislative moves. Newark's embattled school superintendent gets a new contract. We get reaction. And we've got sharks. Tonight on NJTV News. Hello again. It is New Year's Eve at the state capitol. The fiscal year ends tonight at midnight, and that means the governor was facing a deadline, bills to sign and bills to veto, and political impressions that could very well carry far beyond the borders of New Jersey. Word coming down to us just before we took air at 6 p.m. this evening that the governor had made his decisions, had made his moves, and our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron, is standing by for us at the State House to give us a sense of, of what the governor did here, Michael. What, what's the headline? The headline is that the governor kept his word, uh, was good to his word, uh, kept his threat, as it were, to reverse what the Democrats did. They hiked taxes on millionaires. They put a temporary one-year tax hike on business. They fully funded the state pension system. The governor undid all of that, just as he has been saying for weeks he would. Interesting, Michael, because the governor not only undid some of the things that the Democrats wanted to do, but he also apparently undid some of the spending that he himself had proposed uh, earlier this year. That part of it is unclear to me. Uh, initially, when I looked at uh, the governor's press release of 6 p.m., I thought, gee, there's some extra cuts in here. But the more I study what happened, he was presented with a $34.1 billion budget. His office touts that it's now a $32.5 billion budget. But that $1.6 billion difference is exactly what he took out of the pension system. And since the millionaire's tax and the corporate business tax surcharge were separate pieces of legislation, they weren't scored or counted within the budget. So I'm not sure that he cut uh, anything other than the pensions. We'll have to wait for more detail on that. Michael, give me your historical perspective as well. I mean, we literally got word of this at 5.57 p.m. this evening. Is this the way this governor, or most governors for that matter, put this kind of information out on something like this? It's certainly not the way most governors would do it, and this governor hasn't been quite this uh, standoffish and secretive in the past. Uh, Normally, a governor will use the occasion of signing a budget uh, to celebrate the moment. This is not a celebratory moment, as many of his allies said today. But you would at least have thought maybe he'd veto the millionaire's tax in person. He did everything today completely behind closed doors and just by press release. All right. Our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron, at the State House for us. Thank you, Michael. Heading out of Newark, where the battle over school superintendent Cammie Anderson may not be over, but Anderson, which he wanted, a new contract. We asked our David Cruz to get community reaction. At a demonstration outside City Hall today, critics complained that the governor and his education commissioner had done an end run and snuck his superintendent in. Former Superintendent Marion Bolden chairs the education committee of Mayor-elect Ross Baraka's transition team. I don't think as a superintendent you can be successful unless you respect the community. And I think that what you saw here today, they feel totally disenfranchised. As for Baraka, whose campaign was predicated on ousting Cami Anderson, the mayor-elect has not commented, and his office did not return our phone calls today. The mayor-elect had met with the governor earlier this month, but this can't have been what he wanted to see. The mayor doesn't have anything to do with that decision. The mayor has been taken out, any mayor has been taken out of any decision with respect to uh, the, the tenure of a, of a state superintendent. Anderson's New Deal does tighten the reins a bit. It's actually three one-year contracts, which will have to be renewed at Education Commissioner David Hespie's sole discretion every year. It also calls for the establishment of a committee to oversee and conceivably alter Anderson's controversial One Newark School Reform Plan. A statement released by the commissioner was hardly a ringing endorsement, though. As the district moves through implementation, it says, 
it is important to frequently assess where the district is and what leadership is necessary to continue moving the district forward. As for Anderson, the target of angry demonstrations and no confidence votes, she too was not available to talk to us. I am honored to reaffirm my commitment to Newark students and families, she said in a statement, and to work in collaboration with all stakeholders to make Newark Public Schools the epitome of excellence, equity, and efficiency. The teachers' union suggested today that this new deal represented the beginning of the end for Anderson. At the very end of the agreement, it very clearly stipulates that, you know, the commissioner will be, uh, will be overseeing this district and that nothing in the contract changes that. So for all intent and purposes, she'll be an advisory uh, superintendent on a year-to-year -year basis. I personally, I don't know how she could stand uh, that, that humiliation. Ross Baraka will be sworn in as mayor tomorrow. The same day Cammie Anderson's New Deal begins. Their relationship, which can be best described as chilly to this point, will be critical as the city approaches its 20th year under state control. School is out for summer, but parents and activists say they expect to keep the pressure on. And regardless of her somewhat diminished role, they say the next time they see Cammie Anderson, they want to see her walking out the door. In Newark, I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. They're back, and that tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop is Newark Liberty International Airport, where planes bearing the name People Express reappear today. The original People Express went out of business 27 years ago, a victim of the overexpansion that followed its six-year run as a pioneer of low-cost, no-frill service. They were based in Newark back then, but the new People Express calls Newport News, Virginia its home, and that's where its daily flights are going every day from Newark. Our next stop is Jersey City, where the Port Authority has settled a seven-year-old lawsuit involving the Grove Street Pass Station. The place was finished back in 2005, but two groups filed suit claiming it violated federal law by failing to have adequate access for the disabled. The Port Authority had argued that the statute of limitations had run out, but a judge ruled otherwise, so the PA has now filed documents agreeing to add an elevator and other accommodations within three years. And our final stop is Camden, where there was beer on the battleship. The Garden State Craft Brewers Guild Beer Festival on board the historic USS New Jersey. The proceeds benefit the battleship and the guild, raising spirits for all involved. That's your Garden State Express for Monday, the 30th of June. Major funding for NJTV News provided in part by New Jersey Manufacturers, Auto Insurance and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. New Jersey Association of Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njar.com. Verizon, communication solutions designed for the people and businesses of New Jersey. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Wells Fargo, together we'll go far. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. The Star Ledger and NJ.com. Barnabas Health, life is better healthy. Online at BarnabasHealth.org. And PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. Some people say the easiest way to lower high property taxes in New Jersey is to merge school districts. That's precisely what's happening now in Hunterdon County. Brianna Venosi has that report. School may be out for the summer for students, but in Hunterdon County, the merging of three elementary schools and their respective districts begins tomorrow. West Amwell, Stockton, and Lambertville Elementary School Districts, along with South Hunterdon High School District, will dissolve to create a new K-12 South Hunterdon Regional School District. There are some efficiencies. Uh, instead of having three superintendents of schools, there's only one. There's only one business administrator. And we're looking forward to having actually to identify more efficiency, efficiencies moving forward. It makes sense, according to Superintendent Lewis Menker, all three elementary schools feed to the same middle and high school. The entire district is made up of only about 950 students. 
Residents overwhelmingly voted in favor of the change when it was put to referendum last September, and cost savings wasn't the only driving force. For the first time, the schools will have an integrated curriculum, which means an even playing field for the students. My hope, and I guess my guess as well, would be that uh, more districts in New Jersey would look at us perhaps as a model moving forward of how it can be done and how uh, what the benefits are. It's not an easy model to replicate, so says Larry Feinsod, the executive director for New Jersey School Boards Association. To exactly duplicate somewhere else in the state would be difficult. Feinsod calls it something like a perfect storm. The reason why it works there is um, the fact that uh, the people are extremely interested in quality education. Uh, the towns are very similar from a socioeconomic standpoint. Uh, what we have learned in New Jersey is that when consolidation is discussed, very often because of the tax structure, there's a winner and there's a loser. Not here, though. It really enhances the best of the three districts. Um, each district had some things that were probably better than the other, and so it's always good to take the best and combine it in, into one district. Karen Franzini has lived in Lambertville for 26 years and had three kids go through the district. From a coordination, from a cost savings, from enhancing our kids' education, it just makes a lot of sense. Lambertville Public School will still be Lambertville Public School. We're not looking at changing the name or their mascot school colors, uh, all those things are going to retain their history and, and, uh, and culture. Come fall, the administration assures families it will be business as usual. In Hunterdon County, I'm Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. The Jersey City School District made history back in 1989 when it became the first one taken over by the state. Six months ago, however, the state restored some of those powers to local officials. So how has that been working out? Joining us now is the school superintendent, Dr. Marsha Lyles. We welcome you to the program. Uh, is there any noticeable difference in the way you're doing business right now? Well, first of all, let me say, actually, local control, the parts that they have, um, were returned more than six months ago before I got here. The state had already, the state board had already returned governance and fiscal, the fiscal components. Mm -hmm. Since I've been here, though, even though we still don't have certain areas, um, it hasn't been any different for us. When you came to Jersey City Schools, what, what attracted you? Well, I was attracted by the size around the possibilities, having come originally from New York, which was so huge um, and so complex. I thought that there was a great deal of potential in addressing the issues and, and finding some solutions. What's the biggest difference, aside from size and scope, are many of the challenges you face here similar to what you faced in New York, or are they demonstrably well, different? Many of them are similar. For instance, you know, student achievement is pri a priority. Um, working around improving our high schools is a priority. I think the biggest difference, though, is the degree of diversity we have in Jersey City, um, and so that, I think, makes it a lot more doable to address these issues. How so? What do you mean by that? Well, in terms of we have a broad spectrum of students and, and families working together, and while we do have some concentrations of areas where it is not as diverse, we have a strong base, I think, to, to work from. I was going to say, because it sounds very interesting, for anybody to say any place is more diverse than New York City. In some well, respect. you yeah. know, I, they tell me that Jersey City is the second most diverse city in the nation, or in the top, definitely in the top five or six. Um, so that, and our public schools are also very diverse. Um, we have some schools where there are high concentrations of African American or Latino, but overall we have a, you know, 38% Latino, 30% uh, or so African American, a huge Asian population, and, and a white population as well. What is your biggest challenge? Can that diversity in and of itself be the biggest challenge? Well, for certainly a sensitivity to that diversity and understanding of the different cultures and needs and, and, and issues, absolutely. But it is also, I really think, our biggest strength because we have so much to pull from. And in all of the instances, part of this is making sure that while we want to close the gap and make sure that the students who are not achieving where they should be, we do not take away from those students who are and we want to accelerate. So that's part of the challenge. The equity issue for me is the, the real challenge. The uh, equity issue means what precisely? Well, for, for me, equity is making sure that while we are looking for excellence, that we give 
those students and those schools that need more help to achieve the kind of help that they need, the access to the resources that they need. So it doesn't mean everyone gets the same thing, but it means we need to target our resources and target our support so that those schools, those leaders, those teachers who are facing additional challenges can get that additional support. What's the graduation rate at this point? The graduation rate is 67 percent. And where is it trending? We are, we are, we're hoping to inch forward. I mean, it actually, you know, graduation rates are four years in the making. Right. So that it's, you know, it's sort of like, what did we do four years ago, three years ago, two years ago? But we have placed a major emphasis on that, especially our lower performing high schools. And we've been working together. We've implemented this year ninth grade academies because we know that that transition is yet, the most have, challenging. Sorry, you also have a, a free lunch program this summer? We Oh, yes. We just, well, we're very excited about that. We are. Um, are in the seamless summer feeding program mm -hmm. and so we are opening up our doors our elementary um, schools and, and middle schools and a couple of our high schools for to feed children for breakfast and lunch throughout the summer while summer school is in session well we appreciate it that you you've taken the time to come on in and a busy even the summers are busy for you I know and we wish you nothing but the best good luck to you thank you so much Well, this has them buzzing down the shore, graphic evidence that efforts to save an endangered species, the great white shark, appear to be working. Lauren Wonko has the story. It was an experience few boaters ever have. About 30 miles off the coast of Cape May, five fishermen came face to face with a great white shark. It's exciting. Something new, something we haven't heard from a long time. A new NOAA report, a compilation of every known sighting and fishery interaction over a 200-year period, indicates from the 1990s onward the abundance of great white sharks has increased. The white shark was basically um, banned from, from uh, fishery captures in beginning in 1997. And we think that's really helped uh, rebuild their, their population since that time. Also in, an improved ecosystem. We see more seals, more, more tuna in these waters, so uh, there are more sharks. Monmouth University's Ryan Orgera says great white sharks, which can live more than 70 years, have always migrated to New Jersey's waters during the summer. After spending the winter in Florida, they follow their prey like bluefish. The depth where white sharks are most often seen is over 100 feet. Deep. There's no indication from any of this that there would be an increased risk of shark bites. In New Jersey, from 1837 to 2013, there were 18 shark attacks. Six were fatal. The last fatality was in 1960. That's all sharks. Orgera says the statistical possibility of being attacked by a shark is incredibly low. I mean, you're more likely to die because of a bee sting, because of a, a dog bite, because of a, a, uh, a toilet even in the United States. In 1996, there were 43,000 uh, injuries because of toilets and only 19 because of, of sharks. Although the chances of getting attacked by a shark are incredibly low, Orgera says beachgoers should still be smart. Avoid swimming at night and near fishermen. Swim in groups and keep your pets out of the water. Every time you swim in the ocean, you have to remember you're swimming in the world's largest wilderness. I'm not fearful of them. I think sharks are amazing. Swimmers today weren't frightened by the idea of sharks along Jersey Shore. But Orgera says when the 1975 hit movie Jaws was released, swimmers weren't as eager to dip their toes in the water. The movie is based on a novel rumored to be inspired by the 1916 fatal shark attacks in New Jersey. And it's going to happen again. It happened before. The Jersey Beach, 1916, there were five, five people chewed up in the surf. In one Jaws completely changed the way most Americans understood the ocean. I felt terrified, terrified. It was completely believable. This summer, these experts don't want beachgoers to be terrified and instead remember great white sharks are most common offshore, not along the beaches. In Long Branch, I'm Lauren Wonko, and JTV News. Support for the Environment Report provided by PSE&G, making things more sustainable for New Jersey.
All right, now transition time. Earlier this month, I told you on this program that I would be leaving the anchor chair here on NJTV News to get back into field reporting and special reports and to work on several new programs that we hope to have on the air in the coming months. Starting tomorrow, this chair will be filled by somebody for whom I have enormous respect, Mary Alice Williams, who joins us now. We, I was going to say we welcome you to the program, but you're, you're no stranger to this program. Right, I've been filling in for you since, well, it's January, I guess. Public television. Fun. I mean, you, and you're no stranger to public television either. No, I'm not. You've, you've been involved in projects on a, on a variety of levels. What makes somebody, I mean, I, I had this question asked of me a while back. I want to ask it of you. What makes public television attractive to you? What do you watch when you go home? I watch public television. I really do. Just because it's straight, spin-free news and entertainment, fabulous entertainment. I'm devoted to Downton Abbey. But um, I, I think there's a freedom to do the right thing in journalism. This is a difficult job practiced imperfectly, as you know, and practiced by a whole team of really strong people. But um, uh, public television, it makes it a little easier. We're less reliant on the ups and downs of the ratings, mm. that sort of thing. You're also no stranger to Jersey. You, you live in this state. You have I do. I raise my children here. They've yeah. gone through the public school system here. It's a great state. What's the challenge? I mean, one of the things when we came on the air, the challenge of trying to find a way to appeal to those in the north and those in the south at You the know, same Benjamin time. Franklin said at the Continental Congress that New Jersey would be a mere apostrophe between New York mm -hmm. and Philadelphia. And in the was media environment... Was that because his son was the governor and he didn't get maybe, along with him? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but in the media environment, it really kind of has been. Mm -hmm. South Jersey people think that they belong to Philadelphia, and we in North Jersey think we belong to New York. Uh, but we have our own issues. We have our own climate. We have our own economy. We have our own education system, and all those things deserve coverage. That's what we do. We give people enough information so they can make decisions about their communities, their towns, their counties, their state that's sensible. You also, like me, we've, we've touched some of the same bases in our careers in earlier days. We have. Days. We've known each other on and off for years. Absolutely. And you've, you've come up at NBC. We both ended up at one time, separate times, anchoring the Weekend Today show. You were one of the, uh, the pioneers at CNN as well, vice president there in the very early days. What is the biggest difference in, in broadcast journalism now as opposed to back then? That's a really tough question. Um, I think that some of the complaints that, that those guys had back in the 70s and 80s are still complaints today. You know, it's, a, as I said, difficult job practiced imperfectly. The time constraints and the competition make it more difficult to get reliable information out there. We're asking our reporters to feed from the field instead of coming back doing some homework. And that's true even here at NJTV. Um, so it's all the more important that we have a really well-trained staff of people. You have been watching our reporters from the north of the state to the south and sideways. Uh, but you know that we have dozens of people who are in the control room, in the newsroom, in ingest, the area we call where all the, the information comes in, and those people, all we get to do there's is front the work they do every day. There's something called the Omnion here, which they told me about, which is vital to our tech. I, I don't understand it is. I think tomorrow they're going to show me where it is, maybe. Good timing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Listen, I just want to tell you how pleased I am that you, you're going to be here, how much confidence that the viewers can have in you, and that I wish you nothing but the very best. Thank you. That's so sweet. And I'm going to see you because we're going to continue working together. Absolutely. I'm not going to be that far away. And finally, some words of gratitude. I'm not going to say goodbye because, as you just heard, I'm preparing at this point to file reports, anchor special broadcasts, and develop new programs for NJTV and for the WNET family of stations. But I cannot leave this anchor seat this evening without first expressing my gratitude to the people who put me here in the first place and to the extraordinary staff that has been working so hard for the past three years, the reporters and the photographers who literally put themselves in harm's way to get you important stories, to the editors and the producers and the artists who put it all together and make sense of it all. And then there is this pro incredible production team in the control room and right here in the studio. These are the people who literally put us on the air, and they are indeed the best. 
And finally, a very special thank you to you. You know, we do this newscast for viewers like you. It has been my honor to be here, to be invited into your home each and every day, to be able to be counted on in daily routines or in times of crisis, and to know that you were turning to us when you needed information and that we wanted to get the story out to you. So until we meet once again, I'm Mike Schneider. We thank you so much for watching. Wish you the very, very best. And for now, good night. New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Company offers policies that can protect against auto accidents, fires, windstorms, floods, and many other serious and urgent situations. Tips on what to do before, during, and after you're confronted with the unexpected are on the emergency preparedness section of njm.com. New Jersey Manufacturers, helping the Garden State prepare for the unexpected for nearly a century. In this rapidly changing healthcare era, Barnabas Health is dedicated to promoting wellness, preventing sickness, and managing the health of the populations we serve. We've created award-winning outreach initiatives that encourage our communities to adopt healthier lifestyles. We're building a system of care with partnerships across the region. It's designed to increase access to healthcare providers, especially in outpatient settings, to offer more options for high-quality, cost-effective, and seamless family-centered care. Barnabas Health, proud to support NJTV.